think his, uh, Sunita, I think his laptop may have frozen. Um, okay. It's happened before. Can you uh, reassure Dr. Torres we will come back to him? And perhaps yes. we should go on to the next speaker so we have time to go back to him. He was Absolutely. So our next speaker is Erica Hartman from the Downtown Women's Center. She's the Chief Program Officer at the Downtown Women's Center in Los Angeles. Uh, Ms. Hartman is going to be speaking about the unhoused uh, population of elderly women who live on Los Angeles' Skid Row. Uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Hartman. Thank you so much. Um, a little bit about the Downtown Women's Center. We have been, uh, for the last 40 years, the only organization exclusively focused on serving women experiencing homelessness. So we've really gotten to see the trajectory of homelessness um, over the decades. Um, and a little bit about the context of homelessness. Presently, um, our most recent homeless count showed um, that there has been a 20% increase in the older adult population experiencing homelessness. And while for the general population, it's been a 13% increase, for women, it's been a 16% increase. So again, specifically disproportionately affecting older adult women. Um, and just across the US, we've seen this ongoing trend um, of this uptick in terms of who's experiencing homelessness um, being over the age of 50. And um, in the Skid Row community in particular, about 50% of the folks experiencing homelessness, as well as 50% of the folks that we serve, are also over the age of 50. Um, and this is particularly relevant for uh, women because we see that women experiencing homelessness are aging approximately 20 years faster than their housed counterparts. Um, and in terms of the con most contributing factor to homelessness, it's really about income inequities. And women over the age of 65 are experiencing poverty rates, um, or women of color over the age of 65 are experiencing poverty rates that are almost double that of white women. Um, and then women of color also have about one-tenth of the assets um, of white women. And you know, there's lots of factors that contribute to income inequity, but again, we know that people of color are disproportionately impacted um, with Latina women being the lowest earning demographics at about 40, 47% of what's earned by white men. Um, and then just general gender discrimination and women's vulnerability to age discrimination in employment. Uh, women are also the most likely to be caregivers and this can result in gaps in employment, um, fewer years uh, in which to build resumes, fewer years in which to build assets or pensions. Um, and women with children earn about 28 times less than women without children. Um, so really significant um, and also, you know, really important work, but not appropriately compensated. Um, also among uh, folks experiencing homelessness, um, you heard a little bit about the social determinants of health. Um, and these uh, really correlate to the factors that cause homelessness. Um, so we're starting from a place of, um, you know, folks experiencing these multifaceted uh, factors that both contribute to their homelessness and then also contribute to their uh, adverse outcomes later in life. Um, and then also really of note is that uh, women experiencing homelessness actually have shorter life expectancies than men. So in the general house population, we know that women typically uh, live to be about 83 years and housed men is about 79 years um, compared to the life expectancies of women who've experienced homelessness uh, being at about 48 years compared to 51 years for men experiencing homelessness. So um, again, the experience of being unsheltered really takes a physical toll. Um, also less likely to be able to carry out their activities of daily living. Um, and also, we also see that women who are about 45 years or older pay 27.5% uh, more for health exp expenses compared to male counterparts. Um, some additional factors before I talk a little bit more about how uh, coronavirus has exacerbated all of these, um, you know, domestic violence being one of them, um, and that disproportionately affecting women. Um, we know that uh, coronavirus really um, exacerbated domestic violence, women being trapped in homes with perpetrators, um, and then women 
experience domestic violence six times more often um, in low income households than in high income households. So in terms of how these factors um, have you know, interfaced uh, to cause homelessness, um, you know, they all are impacted by affordable housing. Um, many people experiencing homelessness start from a place of social isolation, which we've heard about how um, this is further exacerbated later in life. Um, and even before coronavirus, we were facing this public health crisis um, that really would just laid bare uh, how bad it can, can could get with this type of a pandemic. Um, you know, we saw folks that were unable to shelter in place, um, and many folks were in congregate care settings, which increased their levels of vulnerability. Um, folks experiencing homelessness were in the top three prioritization for risk, but being in the top three meant not getting uh, proper PPE um, and resources at the same rate as like hospitals and first responders, for example. Um, the increase in food insecurity for folks who were already experiencing food insecurity, inability to go to um, food pantries and places where, um, you know, the normal food would have been obtained. Um, Again, disproportionate job loss for women in service industry types of jobs. Um, and then those with jobs are often frontline workers who could not work remotely. Um, and then the limited capacity to practice social distancing, physical distancing. Um, and so in response to this, the homeless services sector focused on uh, what some folks may have heard of, a project called Project Room Key, um, which was created to house the folks who were most vulnerable to loss of life if they contracted COVID. Um, and the eligibility criteria for this was based on being age 65 or older or having a pre-existing condition. Um, so it really started as a way to decompress shelters and congregate living situations um, to help increase physical distancing. Um, and it progressively opened up to other folks who were generally unsheltered. Um, and it consisted of homeless service providers taking over the operations of hotels, providing 24 hour staffing, uh, meals, on site nurses, uh, doctors, health, uh, mental health, and case management. Um, and it was made available initially for 90 days um, through FEMA funding, but as the clock has been ticking down, the pressure is really on to house the folks that are. Um, in room key. So, um, you know, that's really the focus of the homeless services sector, recognizing that this most vulnerable population is going to, um, you know, not have this resource imminently. Yeah, um, sadly, uh, women have been disproportionately impacted by the job loss, um, as well as um, continuing to have some of the lowest earning jobs. And so, um, you know, even though these rent moratoriums were in place, what's going to end up happening is people who weren't earning income during this period of time were not saving money to be able to pay um, this rent that's going to come due. So uh, we're very concerned about that um, and, you know, really what those outcomes are going to look like for women. Absolutely. Sandy again has a question. So I, uh, uh, but I, Sandy. We're, we're also going to be able to go back to Dr. Torres, uh, but my question is, do you think it's safer for older women who are unhoused to be in shelters or to be on their own? Um, that's a super tough question. Um, in, in, under normal circumstances, uh, being sheltered makes a significant difference in terms of outcomes. Uh, women who are sheltered get housed within a few years normally, and women who are unsheltered can take up to 16 years to house. Um, and one of the things that happens that's particularly significant is the exposure to violence that women experience and the resulting trauma and how that affects mental health. Um, and so even compared to unsheltered men, which is about five years, so really vast differences there. Um, and, but in this, setting, you know, there's a big question about is exposure to violence and elements worse than being exposed to coronavirus? And I think that that really depends and it depends on the shelter settings. Um, some shelter settings are uh, rooms with a couple people. Some shelters, um, you know, we, we operate a bridge housing program um, that is an open space with 24 beds. And so that's, um, you know, a lot more exposure. And 
we were very fortunate to be a project room key provider. Um, and we also have, uh, through a public private partnership, launched something called Project 100 to house 100 women directly from Skid Row. Um, so we're really trying to move women into more permanent housing so that when Project Room Key ends, uh, there's a place for them to go. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Erica. Uh, Dr. Torres Gill, you're back. Yes, thank you very much. I'll make my comments. Uh, I'll shorten them and the vagaries of Wi-Fi connections and Zoom. Uh, but uh, in either event, uh, I just uh, want to just raise two key areas in terms of policy and the policy side of what we're addressing. The first, uh, uh, we've seen a resurgence of what we refer to as ageism and ableism discrimination based on age and disability in different parts of the country. And as a member of uh, the governor's master plan on aging, uh, we worked very closely with the Department of Public Health and Aging and the governor's office because initially a few weeks as the state prepared for a potential resurgence and scarce uh, medical care and ventilators, they tried to sort out who would get priority if there weren't sufficient uh, medical services. And the initial proposals to our great consternation was to in fact ration these services based on a point system that would give preferential use for these scarce resources to younger folks, those who were assumed to have a longer life expectancy, and those without pre-existing medical conditions. That would have targeted directly those who are older, those who have uh, various types of disabilities, and would have put them at the back of the line, so to speak, a clear example of ageism and, uh, ageism and ableism. The good news, after pushing back advocacy, working closely with the governor's office, they completely turned it around and their new care standards for uh, potential medical resurgence of this virus is to ensure that there is no discrimination based on age and disability. I mentioned that first, it's kind of good news. We're able to turn things around, but also because in this pandemic, as we talk about social isolation and social determinants of health, we have to be very cognizant that there is sadly discrimination based on age and disability, and we have to work against that. Our new front in terms of public policy is working closely with the state legislature, the state senate, and the governor's office. Given the economic impact of the pandemic, uh, the governor and the state are having to face major cutbacks in all areas of social public health and educational services. And uh, right now we're working with the governor because some of the initial proposals were dramatic reductions in the very programs that allow older persons to remain at home. Major cutbacks in in-home supportive services, adult day healthcare centers, Alzheimer's support services. And so now our current efforts with our master plan on aging group with our fellow advocates is to educate, inform the state legislature, work with the governor's office to minimize the impact on the various home and community-based services without which would force many older adults to go back into skilled nursing facilities, institutional care. And we now know why that is not the preferred outcome.